after studying this module, you shall be able to know the pricing for infrastructure sector, learn the role of subsidies in infrastructure, identify the pricing issues in developing and transition economies, Analyze how to design effective subsidies. State-owned infrastructure monopolies in developing countries often fail to achieve widespread service coverage. Thus, infrastructure reform must be designed to increase the access to affordable services for previously unreserved customers, mainly poor and rural groups. Pricing policies and subsidy mechanisms play a very crucial role in achieving this goal. Past pricing policies and subsidy mechanisms were seriously flawed and usually failed to achieve their stated objectives. Rather than providing affordable infrastructure services to poor people, they undermined the financial viability of utilities, resulted in rationing of services and actually exacerbated inequality. Thus, there is an urgent need for tariff and subsidy mechanisms that do a better job of achieving economic efficiency and social equity. Pricing of infrastructure sector. Successful restructuring and privatization requires pricing policies that provide signals and incentives of efficiency to customers, suppliers and investors. Yet, in many developing and transition economies, pricing continues to undermine the economic efficiency. Prices are often still set by ministries with mandates to establish price controls that support microeconomic goals. So, in addition to adopting privatization, timetables and establishing regulatory institutions, developing and transition economies must rebalance and regulate prices as part of second generation reforms. Some deviations from optimal pricing are due to the political and social constraints. Non-economic and equity considerations inevitably influence the efforts to implement economically efficient pricing. Indeed, inefficient pricing is often the outcome and instrument of a complex system of cross-subsidies under the broad domain of social policy. But, Deviations are also due to the lack of appreciation for alternative pricing schemes that could better balance the economic efficiency and social equity. In particular, price differentiation and competitive pricing flexibility are potentially valuable tools for achieving the adequate revenue and expanding service to poor people which have not been sufficiently exploited in developing and transition economies. Policy solutions consistent with both economic efficiency and social equity are not always available or politically feasible. Accordingly, price reform is among the most challenging tasks for policy makers in developing and transition economies. It is also a policy area where replicating approaches in industrial countries will likely prove extremely problematic and where technical assistance from multilateral organizations and other external advisors has been highly unsatisfactory. At first step, transition economies should examine differentiated non-linear and other pricing schemes that could ease the transition to cost-reflective competitive prices. The emphasis should not be on setting the optimal tariffs, but on reforming tariffs to find feasible changes in tariff structures that both improve the welfare and generate adequate revenue. Even optimal prices, if instituted extremely quickly and without enough notice, can lead to a damaging and costly transition. Moreover, customers without viable alternatives will suffer the most. Thus, policymakers should plan early for a smooth transition to cost-reflective prices. This point has been ignored in some restructuring and privatization programs, creating public disenchantments with reforms and a danger of policy reversal. Pricing issues in developing and transition economies. The main pricing issues for policymakers in developing and transition economies 
are inadequate revenue and unsustainable social pricing. Inadequate revenue. Inefficient pricing was one of the main reasons for the deteriorating performance of infrastructure sector in developing and transition economies prior to the reform era. Although inefficient pricing was also a problem in industrial countries, their less developed counterparts were less able to afford the cost of misallocated resources and inefficient production. The failure of many governments to prescribe cost-reflective tariffs hindered service expansion and decapitalized the network utilities. Service quality suffered and the inability to provide better and more varied services constrained the domestic growth and hampered the international competitiveness. This problem was particularly pronounced in telecommunications but also serious in electricity and transportation. Unsustainable social pricing Because the demand for many infrastructure services is highly priced and income inelastic, their pricing has important distributional implications. Subsidizing basic services such as electricity and water appears politically attractive because it can approximate a lump sum grant based on the number of household members. Conversely, raising the price of basic services appears like a lump sum tax that bears heavily on the poor, the elderly and those with large families. Not surprisingly, moves towards cost-reflective tariffs often encounter strong political obstacles. Thus, past infrastructure policies have resulted in prices with systematic cross-subsidies. The publicly articulated rationale is that such policies foster social goals, that is, help the customers who would otherwise be disadvantaged, and economic externalities associated with the universal service. But economic theory and regulatory experience suggest that it is impossible to maintain a significant cross subsidies in the structure of prices for long with open entry and no remedial policies regardless of whether that seems desirable. So, policymakers in developing and transition economies suffer from a seemingly irreconcilable dilemma. Social development goals and political pressures have led them to set infrastructure prices with significant cross subsidies. Yet, in recent years, these policymakers have sought to restructure, liberalize, and privatize their infrastructure sectors. These two goals are incompatible because competitive entry will destroy the cross subsidies. Possible solution competitive pricing flexibility. Uniform pricing and regulatory prohibition of price differentiation can seriously undermine the revenue adequacy by limiting the ability of infrastructure operators to exploit demand characteristics and extract more revenue from high value customers. As an alternative, demand differentiated pricing can alleviate the need for radical tariff rebalancing. If an economy is to benefit from market liberalization, infrastructure entities must be allowed to compete with flexible prices and terms. Prices will best serve the public interest if they are allowed to vary among the classes of users in accordance with the value of service and in response to the marginal cost of the service. The need to set some prices low to retain business means that other prices should be allowed to be higher to secure adequate revenue. In telecommunications, for example, policymakers should permit the rapid installation of new telephone lines, wired or wireless, based on prices that reflect differences in the value of service and clear service backlogs. In addition, customers who place more values on a service should contribute more revenue to cover unattributable, fixed, and common cost. By offering discounts with non-linear prices to non-captive customers, the utility will be able to recover the cost of the local loop with marginal access prices much closer to incremental cost and keep all the customers in the network benefiting all. Next steps. 
The priority for action involving both applied research and detailed policy analysis is to develop the practical, flexible, differentiated pricing rule for infrastructure services that balance the economic efficiency and social equity. This agenda will also entail creating a cross-country database on infrastructure prices and regulations that permits emerging regulators to draw international benchmarks. Reform programs in several countries have been criticized as excessively increasing prices and hurting the poor people, yet reform is essential to achieve the developmental goals including poverty reduction. Pricing is an area of policy where practical research is needed to aid the real-time design and application of better, second-best, but workable reforms. This applied research should draw on the theoretical literature on competitive pricing flexibility and non-linear pricing to design transitional approaches that allow cost-reflective prices in restructured and privatized network utilities taking into account the regulatory and information constraints and perceptions of the social fairness. The next is a practical pricing regime. Data shortcomings are a key obstacle to economically efficient pricing regulation. And because of the weak auditing and inadequately trained regulators, information problems are likely to be especially severe in the developing and transition economies. In particular, information is generally unobtainable on demand elasticities and other attributes of demand. Constrained market pricing. Constrained market pricing offers a promising solution to this dilemma. This approach divides the setting of product prices into two stages. In the first stage, the regulator imposes floors and ceilings on the prices of the regulated firm. These limits can be determined solely with the aid of information on cost. The second stage of price setting is left to the firm, which will be driven by self-interest to take into account demand conditions. The firm is prohibited from setting the prices that violate the limits imposed by the regulator, but is free to select prices that best promote its interest. Regulated ceiling and floor prices are derived from the competitive market model. Thus, the firm cannot adopt a price higher than what an efficient entrant or rival could afford to charge for the product in a competitive market where inputs are available on competitive terms. This price ceiling is the standalone cost of the product or service. A price constraint not to exceed the standalone cost ensures that the customers pay no more than they would have if the item had been sold in an effectively competitive market. The floor price reflects the product's marginal or average incremental cost. This approach, in a sense, seeks to enforce competitive behavior where such behavior is not the automatic result of the market conditions. The main purpose of the standalone cost ceiling, aside from its role in eliciting economic efficiency, is to protect the consumers from monopolistic exploitation by the regulated firm. Similarly, the main purpose of the floor pricing, economic efficiency aside, is to protect the actual or the prospective rivals of the regulated firm from predatory pricing and related practices that can handicap these competitors or drive them from the field. The application of differentiated pricing in developing and transition economies, when it has even been considered, has often been dismissed as being too difficult and contrary to social equity. But it is possible and indeed imperative for such a pricing approach to be made practical in infrastructure sectors facing chronic revenue inadequacy, underinvestment and low coverage. Differentiated pricing rules should be considered a source of qualitative guidance rather than a generator of precise, definitive pricing prescriptions. Price differentiation can do much more to alleviate revenue inadequacy than can standard uniform price rebalancing schemes such as across the board price hikes and can provide greater potential for social equity than unsustainable internal cross subsidies under uniform prices.
facilitating access to bottleneck facilities. Utility restructuring requires the policymakers in developing and transition economies to address a difficult new issue. As a part of restructuring, potential competitors often require access to essential network facilities. Thus, the removal of legal barriers to competitive entry is not sufficient to ensure the effective competition in infrastructure. Competitors must also have access to bottleneck facilities on non-discriminatory terms if they are to have a reasonable opportunity to compete. Explicit regulatory intervention may be required to ensure such access particularly if these facilities are controlled by the incumbent infrastructure operators who will often have business incentives to deny rivals fair access. Regulators in developing and transition economies must ensure that competitors have access to bottleneck facilities on terms consistent with efficient competition setting a level and structure of excess prices that promote dynamic efficiency through entry and investment decisions while enabling the owner of the network to remain financially solvent. Prices should be high enough to be compensatory, at least covering the long-term incremental cost of the entrant use of the network, yet not so high as to preclude efficient operations by the entrant. The access problem is especially vexing when competitors require a bottleneck input controlled by one of their rivals. Monopoly control of bottleneck facilities can create powerful incentives to behave anti-competitively and cross-subsidize unregulated competitive activities from regulated monopoly ones. Without regulatory constraint, the holder of the bottleneck monopoly can repress the competition by creating artificial handicaps for its rivals for the final product sold to the consumers. The monopolist can impose cost on its competitors by impeding their access to the bottleneck, thereby raising the prices that they must charge to cover their elevated cost and so weakening their ability to compete. Two approaches. The economic literature offers two ways to price bottleneck facilities efficiently. The Baumol Willing Efficient Component Pricing Rule or Parity Pricing and the Lafont Tyrol Global Price Cap Rule. Under the Efficient Component Pricing, the holder of the bottleneck facility should charge as much for its services as it would earn from providing them itself. This approach is consistent with efficient competition it ensures that responsibility for supplying the contested services is distributed among actual and potential rivals in way that minimizes the total cost. But it does not permit the competition to fulfill other important functions of eliminating allocative inefficiency and eroding the monopoly profits. Thus, regulation must determine how large a markup of the retail price above marginal cost is economically efficient and what level of contribution should then be included in access charges. This requirement is likely to be violated in developing and transition economies with deficient regulation where regulated price structures are often inefficient. The Lafont Tyrol rule recognizes that the profit of the integrated incumbent is an increasing function of both the access charge and the final retail price. Under a break-even constraint, a higher access charge would permit the regulator firm to lower its final price. A regulator concerned with consumer welfare would take this trade-off explicitly into account. The socially optimal access charge will depend on the benefit of reducing the retail price, which will depend on the elasticity of demand and the effect on productive inefficiency of raising the access charge which will depend on the entrant's elasticity of supply. Despite their internal consistency and powerful theoretical results, translating either approach into workable rules and actual access prices has been proven extraordinarily difficult and contentious. The first approach suffers from restrictive assumptions that limit its applied policy content. Indeed, the case for adopting the efficient component pricing rule is not so unequivocal if 
allocative and dynamic efficiency are important issues as is likely in many developing and transition economies. That is, when even inefficient competition could make a substantial contribution to allocative efficiency and to increased efficiency and service innovation. The lafont tyrol rule has substantial information requirements. Demands and supply elasticities are hard to estimate. Thus, it is challenging to translate it into the operational rules that can be applied in the real world settings. Next steps. An important policy priority in the restructured utilities of developing and transition economies is developing the regulation for network access that has realistic prospect of being implemented effectively. There is an urgent need to translate the principles and results of theoretical and analytical work on access into workable rules and procedures, especially in the face of severe problems measuring relevant economic variables. One promising direction for applied policy analysis is to build on the powerful insight of the efficient component pricing rule and the Lafon tyrol price cap rule and develop a hybrid model that combines the two approaches with the objective of promoting productive and allocative efficiency. Moreover, in developing and uh, transition economies, it is imperative to identify the conditions if any, under which it is appropriate to use access pricing as an instrument to promote supplementary goals, such as expanding service to poor people that go beyond attainment of economic efficiency. The next is the role of subsidies in infrastructure, promoting access to poor households. In recent years, there have been growing concerns about how privatization and market liberalization have affected the low income households in developing and transition economies. Some observers are concerned that competition will make the traditional method of financing access for low income households cross subsidies from higher income customers difficult if not impossible. The fear is that new service providers entering the market will target only the most profitable customers eroding the profits that incumbent enterprises used to subsidize service for low income groups and high cost areas. So, even if privatization and competition result in service expansion and lower average tariffs, poor households might end up paying higher prices and governments might need to find new sources of financing for universal access, a difficult task in developing and transitional economies due to inefficient and distorted tax systems. Low service coverage among low income households in urban or peri-urban areas of informal settlement, slums and rural areas in most developing economies indicates that public monopolies have failed to achieve the universal access. But it is not clear that privatization and liberalization will automatically benefit these households. Although public monopolies are often overstaffed, inefficient and lack the resources needed to expand services, governments often heavily subsidize tariffs. Moreover, many utilities subsidize certain customers and services, though these funds do not always reach poor people. Thus, the impact that reform has on coverage will depend on how it influences the incentives for investment and prices for the poor customers. The limited data on how reform affects poor people drawn from the case studies and household surveys suggest important trends. First, there is little evidence that reform consistently reduces the access for poor urban or rural households. Even when service prices have increased for these households, the share of poor urban and rural residents with connections has often not fallen and in many cases has even increased. Further, allowing competition can dramatically improve the infrastructure services for poor people. Competition can allow a range of price and quality options making service possible to regions and customers that a monopoly provider would never have found profitable. Subsidy schemes and reforms should be designed to achieve. Effective targeting benefits should accrue to the intended beneficiaries such as poor people or rural population 
positive net benefit, subsidies should pass a cost benefit test. Administrative simplicity, schemes should have reasonable administrative cost. Transparency, financial cost and payment channels should be clearly defined and open to public scrutiny. Designing more effective subsidies. Many of the infrastructure subsidies in developing countries are very poorly targeted. As a result, poor people and other vulnerable groups capture only a small share of these subsidies. A key reason for this shortcoming is that most poor households in developing countries lack access to basic infrastructure services. In transition economies, where service coverage is much higher, subsidies have done a better job of reaching poor people. There is no universally appropriate model for designing subsidies. Every support program must be tailored to national and local characteristics, including the country's stage of development, institutional capacity, and economic conditions and state of public finances. Still, several basic principles should be applied when designing and implementing the subsidy reforms. Effective targeting is arguably the most important consideration and greatest challenge in designing and reforming subsidies. A variety of targeted subsidy mechanisms have been devised that rely on observable indicators of poverty, the amount of services consumed, the characteristics of the neighborhood or regions, and the characteristics of the individual households or dwelling, individual targeting. Preliminary analysis suggests that explicit targeting geographic or individual performs better than the implicit schemes that rely on the modifications of the tariff structure, for example, changing the size of the lifeline first block under an increasing block tariff structure. Explicit targeting reduces the errors of inclusion, that is the extent of subsidy leak age to unintended beneficiaries. But it also tends to substantially increase the errors of exclusion, that is the share of intended recipients who do not benefit. These trade-offs can be resolved only with reference to the policy goals underlying each subsidy program and require considerable empirical analysis. Moreover, Targeted connection subsidies perform much better than targeted consumption subsidies by reducing both inclusion and exclusion errors. Recovering connection fees through moderate monthly access charge or providing credit to finance connections or both might be especially appropriate in countries with underdeveloped capital markets for personal loans. Otherwise, high connection fees can preclude low-income households from obtaining the infrastructure services, even if such households could afford equivalent monthly payments. Every price subsidy scheme, no matter how well designed, suffers from limitations such as distortions of relative prices, leakage to untargeted groups or wasteful consumption that reduce economic efficiency. The redistribution goals embodied in such schemes can be achieved with less distortions of economic efficiency through targeted income transfers under a broader social safety net. Governments can allow prices to signal their true economic scarcity cost while providing direct subsidies to the consumers who cannot afford those prices. But the administrative requirement of direct subsidies may be beyond the capacity of many developing and transition economies. Moreover, there are practical difficulties in designing eligibility criteria. Thus, despite their imperfections, targeted price subsidies might still be preferable. Next steps. To design pro-poor regulation and more effective subsidies, more consistent and comprehensive household data on consumption, willingness to pay and various socio-economic characteristics should be collected and rigorously evaluated. In particular, poor people's demand for services needs to be analyzed more thoroughly, including the factors that affect their decision to connect, the role of alternative and informal service providers, and how the presence of alternatives affects the household connections. Understanding poor people's willingness to pay and their demand for services is critical to assessing the effect of reform and expanding access. For example, data constraints prevent policy analysis 
from determining whether households remain unconnected because they are unwilling to pay for services in the presence of alternatives or whether those alternatives exist because households cannot afford to connect or the utility does not provide service in the area. Knowing the reasons for non-connection is crucial for developing policies that enhance access and for designing subsidies that extend services to poor and rural customers. The performance of alternate subsidy mechanism in terms of targeting extent of pricing and other economic distortions, extent of service expansion to poor households, administrative cost and other criteria requires rigorous empirical assessment. In particular, the relative merits of consumption connection and direct subsidies need to be empirically analyzed to evaluate their appropriateness in different country and industry environment. Summary Infrastructure policy is undergoing multifaceted revision. More than a decade have passed since the first widespread effort to restructure and privatize network utilities. In addition, developing and transition economies experienced a series of financial crises and a sharp drop in private investment in infrastructure. As a result, policymakers in developing and transition economies are seeking clear answers on what to do about infrastructure and reassurances on confident messages from the past. There is compelling evidence that restructuring and privatization when designed and implemented well can significantly improve infrastructure performance. Thus, there is an urgent need to analyze the success and failures associated with past reforms and to identify the instruments and policies that should guide ongoing and future efforts.